Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being at this session. Uh, my name is Holger. I will be the chair of this session. Uh, today it will be about maps apps, uh, map apps. And I think what differs this panel maybe from, from other things you've heard is that probably all of us here have a very similar story to tell. And I think that's the beauty of diversity to say we have, we have something which we want to solve together and everybody did it a little bit differently in different regions. Um, and the map apps are about you know, finding accessible places mostly. And uh, it will work like this that um, we have all, uh, we'll present our projects in you know, 10 minutes or less. And if we have time uh, later, we will, we will have some questions. Um, and uh, yeah, with me to quickly say, we have next to me is uh, Toshia Kakiuchi Mirairu. Okay, he's nodding, great. <laughs> Uh, from Japan, Jason Da Silva uh, from the United States. We have Noel Dali from Ireland, and, and Matt McCain also from Ireland, and Yuriko Oda Padam from Japan, who will present their projects very, very briefly. And I hope this makes for an entertaining session. And maybe you can also take something away beyond mapping apps and apps in general, but more on how to collaborate together. Um, let me quickly start by presenting why I'm here, probably, and. So, yeah, of course, please uh, tweet and, uh, and share on Twitter as well your questions. I try to follow along. Um, so I'm with Sozialhelden. It's a nonprofit organization based in Berlin. And uh, I will tell you two things what we did. did. One is WheelMap, and the other one is called Accessibility Cloud. Uh, so first, WheelMap. Uh, so we had this problem, which places are uh, accessible for people with disabilities. And because this information was very hard to find, and it makes taking part in daily life very difficult. So people tend to stay at home. It was actually my co-founder, Raul, who's using an electric wheelchair, and me, who always went to the same coffee shop to have coffee. And so I said, like, this shouldn't be the case. We should be able to go anywhere, or at least we should know where we should go, because it's a human right, after all, to take part in daily life. But we started with our own itch, basically. And so we built WheelMap. Uh, in 2010, and until now, it has 840,000 marked places. It's online in 24 languages, and it's available for uh, also in apps on different platforms. And these four, 24 languages also include Klingon for all the Star Trek fans here, because it's translated by, by uh, you know people from the crowd. We have a whole group of translators. Uh, we also found it's good for other people. Of course, you see this in every panel here yesterday and today, I'm sure. Um, and so we do 100,000 places per year, and we think it, it's because of two ingredients. One, it's, it's really easy and quick to contribute data. You don't need to sign up for WheelMap. You can just you know, do it. And also, we, uh, we invest in people and time and energy to do these mapping events where people come together. And you will see this, I think, also with the others, that it's about the people doing this, empowering of these people to do this. Uh, so that was WheelMap, very briefly. And, but we saw the next project I'm going to tell you is about Accessibility Cloud. Because we said, okay, we were not the only ones when you look around and as I said, our project grew internationally. We saw like there is somebody in the US, there is somebody in Japan, so are we doing the same thing? Is it a problem? We think it's more that we need to be able to work together. So Accessibility Cloud is an exchange, data, data exchange service. Uh, so the idea is that if this information, what we all, our users are all gathering, is shared more widely, we have a bigger impact. Because, you know, you say, you decide to go to Paris as a tourist, let's say, and then you want to, to find, your, to, to find a, a nice coffee, maybe again. You don't really mind, like, whose app it was. You maybe don't even know that Jack said is a big app in France. But you use whatever you're using, and the information should just be there. That would be inclusion, right? And to start this, we started to collaborate as accessibility apps, but eventually we want to bring this beyond. 
Also, we bring in data from not accessibility apps, from Foursquare as one partner, for example, from governments. So anybody who has information, like is there a wheelchair accessible toilet, is there accessible parking spaces, and any of these information, we bring that in. And we have more than 50 data sources right now connected. And it's not only about wheelchairs, we have more than 150 uh, accessibility criteria. And that makes, uh, the first result is that we redesigned WheelMap and we have 1.3 million places now with partnerships like with Access Map from Jason, what you want to see. So to bring this vision to life that you just click where you are and you see all these different places and you can learn, oh, there's more information on this app and on that app. And so we are sharing this all together. Uh, here, one technical thing how it works is the people keep their ownership of the data, so we're not, we don't want to make one pool. It's more, it's, so every organization is sovereign and can join or leave this any time. Uh, so you can, uh, so WeMap, for example, is based on OpenStreetMap, so it's open data anyways, but it could also be commercial players who don't, you know, who don't have that liberty. So they can, we make this to this exchange format and we can not only then display it on WheelMap, but on any app, and also you can create new apps for that. So that's what we do. Um, we even have now elevator and escalator status in real time, and this is, I think, where, where it's going. So what can you do? You can go out and map places, of course. You can, that's the whole thing. And also you can share data you have and get data on Accessibility Cloud. And I think I kept my 10 minutes. <laughs> And with that, uh, I hope uh, um, we, can, we can share this idea on how we can collaborate while doing and nurturing our own communities uh, from the different perspectives of these different apps. Uh, enough from my side. Uh, I would like to hand over to, to Shia to present what he's done in Japan. Good morning. I'm very glad to be here to share with you our experience with BeamUps. BeamUps is an app to share information on the accessibility of places, but it is more than that. It is our first step for connecting persons with disability and businesses. We have a clear vision to create a society in which anyone can go out with ease and peace of mind. BeamUps is a tool to help achieve this vision. Let me start by introducing myself. I'm Mirairo. I have been using wheelchair since my childhood. When I was in university, I thought about what I could do, preciously because I was a wheelchair user. We specialize in consultancy on universal design. For example, we give advice on how businesses can better accommodate persons with disabilities. There are values which can only be created by those who have the experience of facing barriers. At Mirairo, we believe that what may be seen as a negative can be transformed into value. This is our corporate vision, barrier values. We want to create an inclusive society, one which enables us to maximize our value each one of us. Now, let me move, to, to move on to BeamUps. It is an app to collect and share accessibility information of places such as restaurant, shop, and public facilities. We receive financial support from the Nippon Foundation and the Kampan Center. Anyone can download it for free and select a language from Japanese English or Spanish. BeamUps is innovative because it, it is useful for everyone with or without disability. 
in addition to the information of physical accessibility, such as the number of steps at the entrance and the availability of a wheelchair accessible toilet. BIMAP includes as a feature which are useful for a wider group, such as whether it is quiet or not. Some people who are sensitive to noise or are blind persons may find this information useful or whether it is well read or not. The person may prefer an environment where they can see sign language better. Other features such as the availability of, uh, of credit card payment can also be shared. It is useful for anyone who prefer, prefers to pay by card, including foreign tourists and person with visual impairments. Another unique characteristic of BMAPS is that, is that it is fun. It has ranking and competition features. You can view user ranking. It also shows which city has more places reviewed within their localities. This way, we can get local governments interested in improving accessibility. Finally, the team competition features has proven to be very popular among users. You can create your own competition platform with your friend and colleagues. In less than two years, BMAPS is creating a movement for accessibility information collection and sharing. Now, there are over 5,000 users. They have reviewed more than 70,000 presses. More and more private companies and schools are getting involved in this movement. We also collaborate with central and local governments. They see it as an effective tool for raising awareness. Finally, BMAP is going global. There are BMAP users not only in Japan, but also in other countries. We believe that there are three successful factors. Firstly, BMAP has been user-centered since its inception. Persons with disability were involved in the development process. Secondly, we organize press review events in collaboration with company and school. These events offer opportunity for the participants to look at their neighborhood from fresh perspectives. We invite persons with disability to join the walk around town and to share their views. Thirdly, we combine press review activities with awareness raising activities. Persons with disability facilitate their awareness raising sessions. As you can see, the engagement of persons with disabilities has been at the heart of BMAPS since the beginning. Now, let me share with you the story of Issei, one of the biggest BMAPS fans. His life improved greatly after he began using BMAPS. He loves going out, but he faced many challenges. He used to arrive at shops and had to give up entering because there were steps. Now he can check the accessibility information in advance. He used to feel hesitant to invite his non-disabled friends out because it was a lot of trouble finding where he could go. Now he can suggest where to go and he feels more eager to ask them out. We want to see more persons with disabilities, like Issei, venturing out with the information on BMAPS. At the beginning of my presentation, I said that BMAPS is more than an app for accessibility information. We have a vision to create a platform for 
comprehensive concierge service, which connects persons with disability and businesses. BMAPS is an entry point for that. Please imagine you are wheelchair users, you are going on trip, and you need to book a hotel and air ticket. You have your accessibility needs and preference registered on BMAPS, so you don't have to repeat them. Each time you make booking, you can find an accessibility hotel on BMAPS and book it through BMAP as well. You can book an air ticket and all the necessary support will be provided without you asking for it. Or please imagine that you are deaf. You find a restaurant, and restaurant on BMAPS and want to make sure that they understand, understand your food allergy. BMAPS will connect you with the sign language interpreter through the sign language interpreter, you can communicate with the restaurant owner. This is the future of BMAPS. BMAPS is financially viable because business will find it profitable to be part of this platform. BMAPS will be the foundation for our one-stop service platform. It will help create a society in which anyone can go out with is and peace of mind. We look forward to collaborating with you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay. So next, uh, Jason, we're looking forward to your presentation. Okay. So hi, I'm Jason De Silva, the founder of Access Map, and I'm here with my colleagues. Jessica Nugan and Brian Danaram. And we're gonna to talk to you about Access Map, which has been around for about 10 years now. And uh, we're excited to talk to you about the upcoming stages of our project. So with that, go to the next slide. Before I go farther, uh, this presentation is dedicated to my grandmother who passed away three days ago. Her funeral was just yesterday. And I wish I could be there. But I'm here presenting with you, which I'm glad to be at as well. So she was a strong supporter in my life. Uh, so the best way to think of Access Map is similar to uh, all apps like what we're doing as well, which is it's an app for social good, but it's also a crowdsourced tool much like TripAdvisor or DL, but it's for people with disabilities and accessibility information. Next. So here are some of my stats. Uh, I'll have Brian pass it on. So currently, Access Map has about 76,000 users, about 150,000 reviews in over 200 cities. Um, that third number, 280 plus mapathons. Um, one of the things we do at Access Lab is conduct access mapathons. What the Access Mapathon is, is a community event where participants essentially, through the Access Map application, uh, split up into teams and compete to rate and review as many locations as possible. Um, it's one of the ways that we've kind of made a game out of social activism um, and created a communal and entertaining way to crowdsource this data. Clicking her. Click her, hold on. <laughs> okay, so here we have some uh, Mapathon testimonials from one of our initiatives uh, through Google Serve, where we had offices, uh, Google offices around the world competing uh, against one another to rate and review. Um, and again, it's just a way of creating a communal effort to crowdsource this data and a way of incentivizing users uh, to crowdsource data. So the Access Schools Initiative uh, is in line with SDG 4A. Um, we've been working with the United Nations to diagnose accessibility around schools. Um, and one of the upcoming initiatives that we're going to take on is uh, diagnosing educational curriculums as well. Um, this is something that we're going to begin researching in uh, 2018 and uh, hopefully begin implementation in 2019. So if you want to talk about uh, Access School Cloud or the API. Yeah, so as Holger was saying, uh, 
we're all working together, so that's a big part of this. This panel is you have five people here or five groups from different places that are all working together to collect our data and share data on accessibility together. One thing that we're doing with the Access Map is we're upcoming coming up with Access Map 2.0, which will release a new API function, which makes it possible to collaborate together. So we will be working with the Accessibility Cloud, as Holger said. And uh, yeah, so we're excited because all of a sudden the data that we have on Access Map, which is 150,000 places, jumps up to over 1 million. And we can all work together to find out accessibility information close or far from where we live. So uh, one exciting thing that we're doing with Access Map is we have the possibility now to see all the data that exists and build it into heat maps. So here is an example of what we're doing just within the United States. We can find, because we have a large amount of data now, the areas that are more accessible, the areas that are less accessible, and policymakers and uh, legislators can use that data to talk about how we can make areas more accessible or not. So Jessica and Nguyen will take over from here, talking about our new initiatives with ActMap 2.0. Hi. So here at Access Maps, we would love to take all the data we've collected and create a holistic understanding of what accessibility is. And one of the things that we are experimenting with is VR Access Map, which is virtual reality. So we have a much more comprehensive understanding of what a location is, whether somebody's sensitive to sound or to light. This will allow a user to see and experience with 360 images what a location is like. Clicker. And in March 2018, we are releasing Access Map 2.0, like what Jason has mentioned before. We are using a big overhaul of data to create a much more updated version of this app and much more functionality with other users. And introducing our new initiative is um, Access Map's newest project, Jace, our journey assisting service enabler. And with this hands-free device, what we're trying to do is create a device that will help somebody in real time navigate to any location they need that has the amenities that they need. For example, if somebody has low vision, we need somewhere to be really bright for that person to be able to do what they need to do. One person can simply ask, Jace, where's the nearest location? A coffee shop uh, that has bright lights for me to go into. And Jace will be able to help you navigate in real time to that location. So all in all, the main point is we all of us on this panel, we strive for a world that is 100% accessible and we're all working together to make that happen. So thank you very much and uh, let's continue. Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, Noel, next, I mean, next up is your presentation. Sorry about that. Um, what way does the clicker work? Uh, yeah, it should just be this next button. This one, okay. Yeah, it was, it's been a little buggy. Okay, so I'm Noelle Daly. I'm from Mobility Mojo. And Mobility Mojo is a, an award winning uh, website and app. It works like TripAdvisor but focuses on accessibility. I have a short little video here to show you how it works. On the home page, type in the location that you wish to travel to. Simply click on the Discover button. Select your choice from the results. Here you will see general information on your chosen amenity. Scroll down to the Accessibility section. Here you will find information on the facilities and amenities available. 
To discover accessibility for upcoming events, return to the top of the page and click on the Explore button. Here you will find a list of events. Choose your event and click to select. Scroll down through the page to see the accessibility information. Click for a detailed breakdown of the accessible services near that event. Plan your complete accessible journey with Mobility Mojo. Mobility Mojo, making life accessible for all. So, Mobility Mojo is innovative because we include hotels, restaurants, pubs, tourist attractions, wheelchair parking and accessible transport and festivals. Uh, we provide the complete accessible journey. So, what somebody can do is plan their whole itinerary. If you're going to a festival, you can plan where you want to stay, where you want to eat, how to get there. And that's what makes us unique. Our impact. Well, Mobility Mojo has only started in 2016 and we're currently active in Ireland. Um, we've personally vetted over 600 listed venues, including hotels and restaurants and bars and tourist attractions. We have almost 1,500 services and these include taxis, accessible taxis and wheelchair parking bays. We have 43 accessible festivals. Um, 400 active users and 4,000 Facebook followers. Our next step is to raise more funds and try and expand into other European cities. We have won six awards during the last two years. We were runners-up in the Irish Responsible Tourism Awards 2016. We have Social Entrepreneurs Ireland Award. We have uh, Enterprise Ireland we won an award there and some funding. We have NDRC, which is a female founders in Ireland. Uh, we won the KBC Bright Ideas Award in 2017 and the ESB Spark of Genius Award. Um, and that allowed us to pitch at the Web Summit in Lisbon. So the founders of Mobility Mojo, both Stephen and myself are wheelchair users. Stephen has an honors degree uh, in business and Stephen has already founded two previous enterprises relating to accessible transport. He sits on the Irish Wheelchair Association and the taxi advisory boards. Um, myself, I have 21 years working in the disability uh, sector, dealing with people with disabilities and their fam family and friends on a daily basis. Uh, I was a co-founder of Spinal Injuries Ireland in 1923. <laughs> And I founded one previous enterprise relating to accessible accommodation. I'm a very strong advocate for just improving accessibility and in travel. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Noella. Okay. Matt, you're next. Hi everyone, I'm Matt, um, also from Ireland. Uh, I'm here today to tell you a bit about uh, what I've been working on for the past few years, and it's Access Earth. So I've got cerebral palsy and I use a roll leader to get around. So I founded Access Earth after I had an experience at a hotel that said that they were accessible, but it turns out they weren't. So, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Access Earth, I sort of founded it on three main principles, that of know more, do more, and live more. So if the users have the right information available to them to be able to plan their trip, then they'll be able to do more when they get there and live more fulfilling lives. In essence, Access Earth is like the Yelp for accessibility. So it works on um, crowdsourcing uh, reviews based on a series of yes or no questions that we ask the user. So. It's an app that's available for Android and iOS, as well as the web. Um, when users register, they say what devices that are suitable for them and what their accessibility needs are. So that when they can find, they can then find places, whether it's a hotel, restaurant, or coffee shop that suits their needs. Um, yeah, so really what we've done is we've developed a set of simple, seven simple yes or no questions that can 
really um, say exactly what a user's unique experience is when they need to find accessibility information. Uh, we, this allows the profile to be individual to the user's needs. Um, we have been working closely with our users as well as a network of international support organizations. Um, and uh, we have a team of uh, four people based between Ireland and the US that allows um, us to get uh, accessibility really to as wide an audience as possible. At the moment, we have 80,000 places rated around the world, mostly focused in the East US and places in Dublin. Um, we have about 5,000 monthly active users, and we've partnered with the likes of the Paralyzed Veterans of America and the United Spinal Association to run local uh, mapping events where they will go out with their user base and just start to rate their local area to be able to tell the local community what's accessible and what's not. We've also been running intensive user session, user focus groups with, in particular, with our partners with Changing Spaces and Aidas Cafe to determine what are useful um, features to have in the app in the future. For instance, um, one of our next users is Candice, who is uh, a parent of a 10-year-old boy with a physical disability, and as such, he needs adult changing spaces. So adult uh, changing tables available in the restrooms. So Candice contacted us and asked whether we could add that criteria into the app. And the way we've built it, it means that it's easily extendable so that whatever, user, whatever user's needs are, we're able to add that question in. And it meant that because disability is something that's effective across the lifespan, that as her child grows, she'll be able to he'll be able to find places that have these changing facilities as he begins to gain independence. Um, our next story is with uh, Dia, who's a 14-year-old wheelchair user. She and her mother, before using Access Earth, had to go and find the restaurant and call the restaurant and visit it in person before even going there, which wasn't really conducive to her independence. She's at the age now where she wants to become more independent and to go out with her friends without having to worry about whether the place is accessible or not. And since using Access Earth, she's been able to um, gain that independence to be able to quickly check whether a place is accessible to her needs so that she can go out with her friends freely. We also have a story about James, who is a 76-year-old caregiver of his paraplegic wife. Now, before using Access Earth, they really they weren't sure where they could go. They had previously enjoyed life with their grandchildren, being able to go out and about. And now that they're using Access Earth, they're able to find places that they can go so that they can enjoy life again with their grandchildren. But we can't continue to do this without becoming sustainable. So Access Earth aims to generate revenue within the second half of uh, this year, uh, primarily initially through a hotel and restaurant bookings. So that's where once the user has found a hotel or restaurant that suits their needs, they can then book straight through the app via booking.com and OpenTable. We're also exploring the idea behind sponsored listings where uh, businesses that are accessible to a user can be um, and appear higher up in the search results as long as they're accessible to that user's profile. Um, so then, again, the next steps, as I said, is to kind of launch the booking system within the second half of 2018 and to, in association with our support organizations, to, relief, to release regular app and website usability updates where uh, we also aim to, by the end of this year, to have 90 cities mapped worldwide. And currently, between the seven awards we've won over the past four years, uh, we've raised the equivalent of 100,000 euro. So we aim now, we're in the process of, in the next six months, raising about the next half a million, which will enable us to grow the team and to map these 90 cities worldwide and to enable everyone to access Earth. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Matt. Next up is Yuriko uh, with her story. 
about Wheel Lock. Yeah, sure, sure. So. I think the mic is on and Yeah. Uh okay. Yeah, I'm ready. Yes. Uh good morning everyone. I'm Yuriko Oda. I'm from Japan and I am the CEO of Vlog, a user generated accessible map for everyone. Before I start, I would like to thank Zero Project for giving me the opportunity to present my work to you here in Vienna. It's the first time to come here. I'm so excited. And now, let me start by presenting my organization. Uh, what is Padam? Next, next, please. Sorry. Click. Oh, thank you. What is PADAM? PADAM is the patient association for digital myopathies, which include progressive diseases such as HIVM, DMRV, HIVM, oh sorry, GNU myopathy, Miyoshi myopathy, and others. Actually, I'm a GNU myopathy patient. Since we are aware of the problems which users are facing, we decided to create an application to try to solve them. But let me ask you this, 4.5 centimeters or 1.8 inches. Could you scare in your finger? Could you make 1.8 inches or 4.5 centimeters? Uh, do you know what this, this number means? <laughs> this is the height of a step I cannot go over by myself in my wheelchair. Next try, please. <laughs> Thank you. I was a healthy person and I could work 15 years ago. I never imagined that I would someday have to deal with the inconvenience of being in a wheelchair. Next space. <laughs> in fact, in fact, there are over 2 million wheelchair users in Japan alone. However, we don't really see them around much because most of them are confined to their homes. Therefore, our mission and vision is to ease their anxiety and enable them to have an active life. Next, please. One of the ways of dealing with this problem is to create an interactive user-generated map that will allow wheelchair users to clearly see accessibility in public spaces. It will allow us to share our experiences and create a buzzer guidepost by which we can explore the outside world. Next, please. In March 2015, we got the grand prize of the Google Impact Challenge and received close to $450,000 in funds. The chief Techno Te technical officer of our team is Dr. Fumihito Ito of Shimane University and the Chief Knowledge Officer CKO is Mr. Kentaro Yoshifuji of Ori Laboratory. We used the funds to create a an unique and innovative accessibility app that makes Relog unique is real-time, real access information generated by the users of the app. Users can use the truck lock to record the places they visited, and they can also share information about spots in 10 categories, bathroom, elevator, parking, shop, station, lodging, ramp, barrier, razor, and others. With VLOG, users can post and request information about places they are interested in. And it's not just information, but also experiences people had in these places. Next, please. Since we wanted, uh, sorry, since we want to focus on movement, we look present accessible routes and spots on the same pages. And actually, we look is one of the few apps in the world which feature feature a track lock. That's why VLOG was chosen by the Japanese government to lead the project of 
gathering learning log information for richer users. Even if we had obtained valuable information about the place we wanted to go, we could solve the problems of how to go there. We believe that type we believe this type of application is the only one in Japan and also in the world as far as we know. And here is the short story about how Wheelog can change lives. This video features an example of the positive impact Wheelog has had on its, use, its users. Since I started using a wheelchair, my world has completely changed. Struggles wheelchair users face can range from entering a restaurant, finding an accessible toilet, to finding an elevator. In Japan alone, one in 60 people is in a wheelchair. However, I don't see them around that much. Still, if people continue sharing accessible information on Wheelog, that can change drastically in Tokyo, in Japan, and in the world. If a place is accessible to me, I can lead the way for other wheelchair users. and not only wheelchair users. Let's make the world better together. Information Wheelog provides can be a great value for people who cannot go outside on a daily basis, but also for foreign tourists with disabilities. Japan is going to host the Olympics and Paralympics in 2002, so this app can hopefully encourage more people to come to watch the game and to come to Japan. In the future, I would like to ask to collaborate with other countries. So we could see, sorry, we could see more people in wheelchairs whenever we go. I am seriously a disabled person. I cannot even drink or eat by myself. But I believe that human beings deserve to live a decent life. Disabled people shouldn't just depend on their sorry, depend on other people, but have a fulfilling life. Therefore, I believe that society should become more involved in this process through technology and experience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Okay. Thank you very much, Yuriko, and all the others. I think now we're well on time. <laughs> we have like 20 minutes or so for questions. Uh, so raise your hand if you, are, if you have a question. Yeah, okay, there are hands going up. I think you were first in the, in the back. Yes, you. Um, please use the microphone in, in front of you. Congratulations, all of you. They all sound really good. I have two questions. Uh, one is, one, I, I'm legally blind and I also have many hidden disabilities affecting my mobility. So one of the things I find most difficult is transport. So I, I wondered if you, any of the apps actually include how to get there. Because often the, I can find out information about the accessibility of the actual place and how to get there. But it's more about the transport. Is there an accessible bus or train? or taxi. So that's my first question. The second one is how often are they reviewed? Because what I find is I, I use one of those apps and they're really terrific, but someone in good intention had decided to put some, change the location of something in the shop or just things like putting bins out the front or, or those sorts of things. It changes quite often. So I wondered how often you review the apps. Thank you. Thanks. So the question was about what about accessible transport information and what about the update cycle? Who wants to, to reply? Yeah. Yuriko? Yeah. Uh, we have uh, 10 categories, spot data. So includes uh, tra public transportation, how to change the train. So yeah, that is very helpful for how to use uh -huh. direct transportation for which users. So in Japan, it's very, I think it's very uh, okay. accessible. Um, so uh -huh. yeah, I want okay. to show it. What about access map? 
Hi. So with Access Map's newest initiative, Project Chase, uh, one of the biggest priorities is for us to help people navigate to their locations in real time. And with Chase, since we're using a data that is updated fairly frequently, we'll be able to help somebody navigate. And uh, with our more direct initiative to take care of that, that is something that we are actively working on as a solution. Okay, and maybe to, to add to this, I showed later that we have this um, real map, real-time information on elevators, whether they're working or not. This has been done with the Berlin Transport, uh, Transport Organization. So we believe like if information is there and available, uh, like when the machines can tell us whether they work or not, uh, then this has been updated in real time. It doesn't go with the bins you said, I'm, I agree. But that's, I think the idea with all of, of us is this crowdsourcing aspect that you know, people walk by and notice there's a new bin and then they will be maybe annoyed by this and inclined to use an app to, to report this. So we hope like on Wikipedia that if there are mistakes and there certainly are, it will increase the quality over time and be updated by the crowd. So hands went up a lot. I think you were next. Uh. Uh, good morning. My name is Daniele Marano from the Austrian Association in Support for the Blind and Visually Impaired. I have a general observation at the same time a question for the panelists. I believe that the major problem which you also observe in Austria is the question of standardization of the information which are gathered in these different apps. I try to explain myself better. Um, if we don't agree on which standards, on what we defined for uh, built accessibility, uh, which norms are we uh, considering? Uh, then we'd be different. We have to, um, if we don't have a common standard, the risk is that we have a heterogeneous, uh, based on the user experience information, which can differ um, a lot, and not guarantee uh, really accessibility for the uh, scope I'm searching for. And so this is my first question: uh, How can we uh, guarantee? A common, at least a common denom a standard um, to guarantee uh, the quality of the services or of the information I can find on these different apps. Thank you. Do you want to say something to that? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think I'm going to pass it to Holger <laughs> because I think that they've done a lot of thinking when they've thought about accessibility cloud and. 50 plus different apps like what we've created, all having different criteria. Uh, so Holger, the question okay. is, uh, <laughs> do you think it's important to have this? Okay, so standards, so the interesting thing, like all the six projects you've seen here, nobody talked about standards. They talked about their daily problems. That when we started women, we didn't really know, we didn't even care to look up what the standard is. We were annoyed by the step at the entrance. Now, we are at a different stage. We have this diversity of information. Some have a five-star rating, some have centimeters. With Accessibility Cloud, we are bringing this together into one exchange format, and this will eventually become a standard, like upvoted by the community. Right now, as I said, we are connecting 50 sources already, and if there is somebody who has, brings in new, a new level of information which is not really covered with the 150 criteria, we can add this criteria. And our goal is to make this an ISO standard once we've proven that this is stable. Okay, this is, yeah, you? Hi, first of all, fascinating. Um, um, this is an issue that we in Israel do a lot of thinking about and have, I've participated in many, many meetings on various options that have been raised and I don't know if it's a cultural thing and it's a little, I'm even a little ashamed to ask the question but I'll go ahead and do it. <clears throat> I have two questions for you. The first one, the thing that uh, we were always afraid of with the crowd, um, uh, I forgot the, crowdsourcing. yeah, crowdsourcing is have you um, ever um, seen a case where the crowd is biased or the crowd is trying to promote uh, one business or crush another business? Because this is something that has been raised as a concern uh, in Israel. 
uh, meaning if, if I have a, a coffee shop and there's a coffee shop next to me, I will put in bad reviews and that way I'll get a higher um, uh, rating. That's one question. How do we deal with that? And the second question that relates to what you said, uh, and I just want to, to uh, fine tune it, <clears throat> in Israel there's a very, very, very elaborate uh, uh, set of laws and regulations. And the, yeah, it's great, but this is the problem here because uh, I understand what you say that uh, um, if you're taking uh, the, the apps and making it according to what is really needed by the people, that's great and that's one thing. But if you give like a, a, a golden star to a place because the people say it's great, but it doesn't fit the law, then you have a problem there because you're, you're giving le le legitimacy to something that is not by law. How do we solve it? Because I can tell you in Israel, we're looking for something like this. Okay, so the question where, what about, <coughs> for what about problems and what about uh, yeah, fraud, basically? And the other was... Uh, was I, I, about, I don't know the legal system about, in your... What about this, the standards which already exist in yes, different countries? Yes. Who wants to go? Yeah. Matt, maybe? So how we've sort of dealt with it is the questions that we ask are very objective. Is there a step free entrance, yes or no? So um, because we're doing crowdsourcing, there's a weighting system involved with the user reputation as they begin to rate places. We ask people to endorse that rating. So if more people endorse it, then their reputation goes up. But conversely, if they've got a low reputation, then the ratings that they put in won't um, really appear. So you mean by um, uh, if somebody says something that others say it's not true, his rating goes down, and then you give less yes. credit? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, the way we do it is we insist that people take photos. Uh, we, we prefer to vet ourselves if we can, but we, we have a very slow process about before putting it up because it has to be validated. We have um, quite a comprehensive tick box list for people to say whether this is there or not. We have looked at all the standards that are out there and we've that used them as our guidelines. There is always this conflict because the standards, what we keep doing is going back to people who have different sight impairments, hearing impairments, and keep finding out more about what it is they need. And then you make your, your list very comprehensive and then it must be backed up with photos so that there's there's trust and reassurance. Um, and it's, it's, it's not too long. It is the bare need to know before you go stuff. Okay. Uh, you're not going to be living in the hotel. You're not going to be living in the restaurant. You just need to know before you go a certain amount of things. Okay. Um, and in that way, you will also get the, you know, people coming back and saying, validating it, which is very important. But photographs are key. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? To uh, share? So just to play devil's advocate, because we did think about this early on, so it's the amount of reviews that you get, which also plays part in it too. So we went on the other side with Access Map where we said, well, it's crowdsourced, so we want the most reviews possible, but we'll leave it up to the crowd to flag if a place needs to be reviewed again or not, and that way we'll get more reviews in, but we'll start populating more because our criteria is not as strict. So that's the other side of things too. I yeah. think they're both valid. Okay, Toshi, you wanted to add something. Hi. First of all, on the BMAP, our app, um, we, we have uh, the users must register their names and their identity. So you, you cannot be anonymous. You have to be responsible for what you put out. それと合わせる形で情報を投稿した人が車椅子ユーザーなのか視覚障害なのか聴覚障害なのかその本人がどういった感覚を得たのかということを投稿することで情報の信憑性を保つようにしています。Okay, and also the user can identify whether he, um, he or she is a wheelchair user or visually or hearing impaired, uh, so that um, 
to ensure the reliability of the accessibility information of each place because it comes from the user with disability. 最後に法律との整合性についてですがあくまで BMAP では法律に準拠しているかどうかというのは明らかにしていません。Amazon のレビューと同じで行ったお店が5段階だったのか4段階だったのか3段階だったのかそれぞれのあくまでユーザーの評価をたくさん集めていくことでまた信頼性を高めていこうとしています。Okay. About the legality issues, we do not、um, focus on the legal, legal, the legal aspects of it, but we focus on the experience of users. And we try to get、um, multiple users' views or reviews on each,、uh, individuals' places to、um, improve the reliability of the information. Okay, and maybe to, to add to your question on what are about the standards and the legalese in different countries. With Accessibility Cloud, you can not only convert between Access Map and Wheel Map, you could also convert like the French standard with the Israeli standard and maybe make, get insights on, like, hey, if we would, what, what about our restaurants in France by this standard? So we, we actually want to go beyond like, a committee in a country saying what's accessible and what's not. We actually want to be more flexible than that. You were next, and then, yeah, thanks. I have a question. How do you finance these apps? What is your business model? Pay the user for the app? Okay, so shall we go like one by one with one sentence, like how you set up? Maybe we start with you? In my BMAP, the business model is that 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 ビーマップから予約ができる問い合わせができるといったことで企業の負担を軽減するといったところから企業からまた収益を得ることを予定しています。Now, um, right now, BMAP、um, is getting financial viability from the,、um, the advertisement or the support from private companies. And in the future, we would like to add a function of、um, making appointments and booking through the BMAP. And the, those companies who are part of the platform will、uh, pay fees to make it financially viable. Okay, Jason. So we are a nonprofit. We got our initial funding from Google Earth Outreach in 2010. And we've been funded by the government of Canada through the Canada Media Fund and through foundations in the US.、So. It's tricky, but we keep trying. Okay, right now we are、um, trying to get funding through、uh, different, different sources, different awards, and government and、uh, sponsorship.、Uh, we hope then to move towards going into the business area where we're going to be getting businesses to, to help and, and support because they will gain in the end. because... Good access is good business. So, if they're gaining more users to their premises, that they will want to use this more. So, there will be a business contribution. So,、uh, initially, right now we're pre revenue, but we've got seed funding from Microsoft and Enterprise Ireland that's getting us to the revenue generation stage where it's primarily through a booking system. So, we're working with OpenTable and Booking.com. To get an affiliate、um, fee back when a user books? Actually, I,、uh, we got a grand prize of Google Impact Challenge, and, but we cannot, we cannot think about it on a business model, but、uh, we will think about it. Sorry, thank you. Okay, so some, so, and also with Socialism, we are a non profit organization. We are funded in part by private companies,、uh, so we, get grant, we apply for grants. We also got grants from the German government, but we also do consultancy for cities, for, for other institutions, and private companies. But also, we, we rely on donations, for example. Thank you. So, more questions? Yeah, you were next. Sorry.、Um, my name is Masahito Kamari. I'm representing the International Telecommunication Union, part of the United Nations. <clears throat> and getting back, getting back to the standardization issue,、uh, since most of the, the apps are on mobile phones, which is part of telecommunication, I think the most、uh, reasonable, logical place to standardize these 
will be at ITU, International yeah. Telecommunication mm -hmm. Union. And we have liaison relationships with ISO as well as IEC. <clears throat> so when you're interested, I think um, we can work together to make it a uh, global international standard. And by recommending to governments, I think there may be a way to publicly funded projects yeah. through uh, governments. Would be, would be amazing. I, I have the feeling that standardization maybe happens after it's clear what's being used, so, but I'm happy to, to learn, and all of, we all are, I'm sure. I saw more hands. Here, I see one in the back. I have a question uh, concerning the future. So for me, in a perfect world, I will go on Google Maps, for example, and find all the accessibility information I need. What is planned for that or in this, in this direction? Google is doing this already since last year, I think. So, and you see, like most of the projects here, are more than 10 years old. So, from from our, from our, it's it's great that they are doing this. I think it's. I hope what you take away from this panel is that we all focus on similar aspects, but on different aspects, and it will always be deeper and deeper in information. And it only works if it is in one day, if it's ubiquitous. So it's not that it's us versus them, but us working together with the others. And I think that's first we need scale, and then we can, we can also integrate with these international organizations. But I'm happy to, for, to hear other opinions here from the panel. Would you like to? No? <laughs> yeah, two. So I think that was well put. So it's uh, so we all are doing different things, and we have different data sources, and we're looking for different criteria. But working together, we can all pull this all together, and time will tell just how how we'll work together. And the idea for now, you know, all of us together, this really is uh, what we're doing is maybe. 10 to 15 years old at max. But what we're doing is uh, really we're at the, I would say, the discovery phase where we're really pushing the, the pushing things forward by collecting the data. And then we'll see what the next step will be. So it is actually a really exciting time. Just, More questions. Can I just answer this one as well? Oh, uh, sorry, yeah, um, of course. Google Earth is great, and you can get your little man outside the building and have a look around, but it doesn't give enough information. You need to go into the building. You need to see, does it have an accessible bathroom, or can you get into the hotel bedroom? And just there's loads more information that you need that it will take a long time before Google will get there. So um, crowdsourcing is probably, for the moment, the way to go, and collaboration, I think it will help. Okay. I don't see hands, please be clear. Yes. Tiny question now. It's really about whether there's the ability to put on the app whether they saw it in the morning, afternoon, or evening. Because my sight is very different at all those times of the day, and the lighting in those places is very different at all those times of the day. So someone might give quite a glowing report but they all might be evening ones, whereas mornings for me might be quite different. Is there ability to do that? Who wants to go? So it's <laughs> yeah, we have a, so for Access Map, we're time stamping all the, the reviews. So it's time stamped so you can tell if it's day or night. That's what we do. So I'm, I'm not sure what everybody does. So I mean, I could just yeah, jump in sure. on that point too. Um, one of the what Jessica was talking about before with the Project Chase development, uh, part of that is to establish Access Map as a low vision service, um, and a lot of the ways that we develop the app is based on the experience of people and the questions we get, and that's not really something that I had thought about was the the difference in. Uh, midday and night and uh, the morning. So that's definitely something we'll take into consideration as we develop Project Chase. 
agencies. And generally, think about the tens of thousands of people who walk into restaurants and public places asking for accessibility. This also raises awareness, and maybe you know they will change the lighting so that it's also good in the evening once a couple of people walked in and asked for this. And I think that concludes also uh, the panel here. I hope you, you took away that you know many communities can thrive and we are still in the early phase of all this. And thank you for being with us here this morning, and I hope you have a great conference for the rest of the two, next two days. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.